Hi, and welcome to the channel. My name is Rosica, and this is The Midnight Reader. Today we're doing something a little bit different. It's rainy, it's a little cold and dreary, and I thought, what better day to attempt a summoning? My favorite booktuber, hands down, is Ariel Bissett. She has been on booktube for a very long time. She now sort of exists more in the podcast realm, which is my favorite bookish podcast called Books Unbound, in which she and her friend Raylene, also of booktube fame, discuss books. However, my book tastes don't always line up with Ariel Bissett, so I thought I would attempt some sort of conjuring to summon her spirit, so to speak, to see if she could give me a couple of book recommendations. So, how do I summon things? Oh, I have a witch cabinet. Hang on. You need a couple of things to sort of summon the like essence of a person. So I need to know things about Ariel Bissett. So I know that she's Canadian, so I need Canada things. I know she kind of likes tarot. I have tarot cards. I do know how to read tarot cards. I learned a sort of like a fun side project. So I do have some tarot cards. What else? Oh, and she's also, as of recently, she is renovating her very old house. I also enjoy renovating things, so maybe I need some, like, construction sort of equipment. Despite saying that she's afraid of antiques, she does seem to decorate her home with a lot of antiques. So maybe I can find some antique -y nonsense. And maybe that will be enough to sort of entreat her spirit to come here and give me some book recommendations. So I think that's what we're going to do. We're bored today. Let's let's see what we can do here. One hour later. Found some items. So for the home renovating sort of industrious woodworking aspects, I have brought a hammer and a small, this is like my stunt drill. Okay, I have a much better one, but I'm unwilling to pull it out right now. So this is a drill. So these are our uh, industrious DIY objects to summon the DIY. To bring in the eclectic antique sort of aspect of her personality, I have brought in several glass doorknobs. I think this one is like smoked, so extra credit. I did steal these from my last apartment because I paid them so much money to fix things and they never did. And these fell off and I kept them and I ain't giving them back. <laughs> I think she might approve of this theft. Ariel, if you ever watch this, I had to live with rodents for a very long time because my landlord sucked, so I'm keeping the door off. <laughs> to add a little more witchy aspects to this, I brought two tarot decks. Uh, this is the Spacious Tarot, and this is Oak, Ash, and Thorn. They're both gorgeous. I'm gonna have a look through and see if I can pull like three cards that remind me of Ariel Bissette. Um, I also brought a candle. It's from Target. I also brought a small cloth because it felt a little bit witchy. So we're gonna, we're gonna make this sort of like our, our altarpiece, so to speak. That leaves a big gaping hole of something that is a huge part of Ariel Bissett, which is that she's Canadian. And deep down, I wanna be Canadian too. So I thought maple syrup would be too easy. So this is what I brought instead. <laughs> it's a crocodile board. <laughs> This is a, a Canadian board game. This is huge, by the way. I'm, I'm not excessively tiny. This is huge. When people come over, I tell them it's the family shield. It's solid wood. It weighs as much as a freaking wagon wheel. It is a sort of like flicking shuttle game. You might find it in like, <laughs> I think bars, but it's very popular. If you don't know what Crocodile is, you should Google it. This is by far the most requested game that people who come over to my house want to play. So we're gonna use this as our basis to summon the Canada. All right, so I pulled a couple tarot cards. I just pulled sort of random cards that just made me think of Ariel Bissette, who I've never met, but I enjoy her content. <laughs> the first two are from Oak, Ash, and Thorn. First one is the moon card. It's like a red squirrel sort of resting under a crescent moon. Moons are all about the unknown, the subconscious. And I feel like if you are into tarot at all, you kind of have to like have a little bit of a relaxed attitude about the things that are like wibbly wobbly and you know, a little unscientific. <laughs> also, it's easily one of my favorite cards in this deck. So I just want to put it out there. <laughs> I also picked a second sort of like wibbly wobbly tap into your like inner eye and you know a little bit of woo woo you have to embrace a little bit of woo woo and that's the high priestess who i also think is like the most gorgeous card yeah and she's kind of about the same sort of thing i'm not going to explain too much tarot to you but these are the cards that reminded me of her so the first two are like you know 
embrace the mystique of the universe. The next two cards are from the Spacious Tarot, so the art style is different. I picked cards that just reminded me of her podcast. So she's always like doing a million things, at least as far as I can tell. So I decided to give her the Eight of Pentacles, which is a honeybee with his many little combs that are all little pentacles. Basically, it's about like being hardworking and doing your craft and all that jazz. So I thought that one was cute. And then I picked another card, which is kind of like about the sense of wonder in a project. Pentacles are supposed to be all about like the material world and your body, your health, um, money, work, things you can touch that falls into pentacles. And I picked one that kind of reminded me of like childlike wonder which is the child of pentacles and it's this very cute bear holding his pentacle in his field and he's very happy. So these are the four that I'm going to lay on the board. One because it's just going to make it look prettier and then I'm going to light a candle and shit, okay? As you can see, I'm clearly transformed into the spirit of Ariel Bissette as I now wear plaid. Therefore, I am both a little bit more her wardrobe and a little bit more Canadian. And I'm wearing a beanie, as she is a fan of beanies. And some of you may say, but Rosica, this feels a lot like your normal wardrobe. To which I would say, shut up. <laughs> it's a fucking Tuesday. It's raining outside and some of us are entertaining ourselves. <laughs> So, the spirit has moved me, we have summoned the spirit of Ariel Bissett, and therefore I have been recommended three books by the universe. So first up is The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating by Elizabeth Tova Bailey. I've wanted to read this book for a very long time, Ariel Bissett has talked about it at length in her podcast. It's essentially about a woman who becomes ill, she becomes bedbound and homebound, and a friend of hers just visits her one day and is like, hey, I brought you some flowers and I brought you this snail. And she's like, why did you bring me a snail? I don't want a snail. And the friend's like, okay, love you, bye, and leaves her with the snail. <laughs> and then it's sort of about like her becoming like more and more fascinated by this tiny creature. She literally has nothing else to do other than convalesce from illness. The second book is how to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy by Jenny O'Dell. This is a book that Ariel talks about a lot. I don't really know too much about it other than it kind of sounds like a self-help book, but also trying to resist my phone and social media is something I'm very interested in <laughs> as scrolling sucks up a horrible amount of my life and I'm trying to get better at not doing that. So I'm, I'm interested in the book. She recommends it a lot and to a lot of people. So I figured I'd give it a try and I think it's pretty short. I'm actually very happy. All of these books are very short. So already Ariel is winning this competition that's not a competition. <laughs> and last but not least, I have to read Ariel Bissette's favorite book, which is also short. So that's a bonus. And that is, of course, Animal Farm by George Orwell. I have read this before. I think it was like a required book in junior high. To be completely honest with you, I don't remember the plot. I know there's pigs, and I also know that I completely intermixed the plot of Watership Down with this book, which is about rabbits. You know, when you're like 13 and you're reading all these books that are critiques of communism and they have all these like farmyard woodland animals in them and you just don't care. We're gonna see if we can add a little more nuance to it now that we're 30 something. <laughs> so those are the three books I'm gonna work on. You're gonna get little updates as this goes along. I hope you enjoy this. I was very entertained by this and now it smells nice in here. I can absolutely recommend summoning on a crocodile board. It, it looks really cute. On to the reading. So I have already finished How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell. 
because I knew I was going to start this video about a week ago and I was expecting it to take me a while to get through because it was the longest of the books, but it, it really went by pretty quick. I listened to it on audiobook on my commute. It was really different than I was expecting it to be. I think I was expecting something more in like the self-help genre of like Atomic Habits or something like that, which I haven't read, but more of like a how to do nothing, do X, Y, Z, you know, a step-by-step -step sort of thing, how to Marie Kondo your attention. That's not really what it is. It's written by a professor. She's a professor of art. She specifically sort of deals in like how art manipulates attention. The book was less of a how to resist social media and stuff like that as much as it was a sort of essay on what attention is, how our current technology sort of hijacks our attention. And it was really, really interesting. She mentioned like a lot of different art projects, which I was not familiar with. If you pick up this book and you're expecting it to be how to stop scrolling before you go to bed, it's not going to be that kind of book for you and you're going to be kind of disappointed. It very much felt like I took philosophy 101 on the attention economy and the definition of what attention really is. And the kind of takeaway I, at least I took from the book was if you want to spend less time on your phone in the many intricacies of social media and the World Wide Web, you basically have to take your attention and focus intently on something else. For her, it was very much like nature and kind of understanding yourself as a teeny piece in the world around you. So she's like a bird watcher. Bird song for a lot of us is just kind of background noise. But if you listen, you really listen and you learn the birds, it's sort of like learning a language. You're going to start recognizing different birds. You might start recognizing different calls that they're making. Basically understanding yourself as a small piece in a bigger narrative is how you can shift your attention away from the sort of like echo chambers that we make. I wound up giving it about four stars because even though I really enjoyed it, I did scroll on my phone while I was reading this book. <laughs> So you can say that I didn't really resist the attention economy. I don't know if I described that very well, but it is a really interesting book. So if this is the sort of thing that interests you, pick it up. It's a good pick by the spirit of Ariel so far. Next up, I'm going to be reading The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating. I was going to save for last because I know I'm going to freaking love it, but I just don't want to read Animal Farm right now. <laughs> So I finished The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating, and it was, it was kind of magical. I loved that book. I loved everything about it. I loved it so much that I immediately started reading it again, because I originally read it on my Kindle, and I wanted to read it on a paper book, and I haven't, like, immediately picked up a book to reread in a long time, so it was really, really good. It sort of centers around, like, a year in the life of the author, who essentially caught like a very mysterious illness that left her bed bound and sort of unable to leave like a horizontal position for the better part of a year and no one knew what was wrong with her and she's like slowly declining and she's not sure if she's gonna die and her life is just this great aloneness until her friend sort of brings her a snail and some violets for company and she just gets completely sucked into this world of what a snail does and watching snails do what they do. It's this beautiful mix of like a memoir and scientific writings on snails because later in her life she kind of kept pursuing facts and trivia kind of about them so she kept up her study of snailery. <laughs> That's not a word. She kept studying them like throughout her life and she kept an interest in them. Strangely, it sort of reminded me of COVID and lockdown. I feel like there's just periods in life when people just kind of get halted flat in their tracks and are forced to just completely stop what they're doing in their life. And for a lot of people, that's illness or death of some kind and grief. You sort of work your way back to caring about the world through investment in something small. And for her, it was a snail. <laughs> and if you have nothing to connect with, sometimes you just have to connect with small things. 
And that kind of reminded me of like COVID pandemic times for some reason, because I think we were all sort of halted completely in our tracks of what our plans were in life and the things we thought we were doing and the places we thought we were going and the people we thought we were going to hang out with. And that was all sort of paused in this strange global way. It gave me a lot of sort of pandemic vibes, but I loved it. Absolutely five stars. I'm rereading it again and I am starting Animal Farm which I have no fond memories of in middle school, but I know it was assigned reading, so we're going to see if it's any better if it's not a book that's assigned to you when you're 13 years old. On to Animal Farm. Well, shit. <laughs> so it turns out that if you read a classic at 13 and then you read it again at 31 when you're not required to read it for class and you have some geopolitical understanding of the giant metaphor that it's describing that is the Russian Revolution, it's significantly more enjoyable. <laughs> turns out that I was overselling how smart of a teenager I was at 13. I thought I was really precocious and really understood a lot about the world. And no, no, I did not. And the book is great. So <laughs> my apologies to, to George Orwell and Ariel Bissett, because I gotta say that I might like Animal Farm better than 1984 which I was not expecting at all. It was a, it was a bit of a turn of events. I, I'm giving it a solid five stars. It's a remarkably easy to read classic. It's shockingly short. It's three hours in audiobook. It has absolutely no superfluous nonsense. And it's great. It's, it's literally great. There's characters representing Lenin and Stalin and Karl Marx and the bourgeoisie and it feels extremely relevant to the world and how propaganda is used to manipulate people and isolate them from their own oppression. I think it's my favorite Orwell. Also, I've never felt quite as upset over the death of a horse, which is saying something because I've, I've read a lot of sad horse books, I guess, in my you know, coming of age. And, and this one was the saddest. It was the saddest because it was a metaphor. And I feel like I should describe the plot of Animal Farm to you because it's, it, it is the Russian revolution retold with animals. And it comes to the final point that those who overthrew their oppressors eventually with power become the new oppressors and become the thing that they vowed to destroy. Okay, so it's the end of the week and my hair is a mess and it's a Friday and I've just come back from dinner and we've had some tequila and it's not, it's not the soberest we've ever been. But also I didn't film a wrap up, which is problematic. So we're going to finish, we're going to finish this off. <laughs> what did we learn from our week with Ariel? We learned that I was very surprised how many books I genuinely enjoyed. I feel like most of the time when you read books that are recommended by people whose content you really enjoy, you'll find that a lot of your taste doesn't match up. But that's usually not why you wind up watching them. You watch them because they're engaging or funny. Sometimes they introduce you to books and content that you would have never heard of nor ever touched. My favorite book hands down was A Wild Snail Eating. Um, that is a new favorite. I will probably reread that whenever I feel bad about the world that we live in. So probably quite frequently. <laughs> Animal Farm was exceptional. And pff, I, I really do think it's better than 1984, in my personal opinion. And it is my favorite Orwell. Thank you to Ariel Bissett's spirit, who blessed me with her book recommendations. She is an excellent content creator. And I love the podcast she does with her friend Raylene called Books Unbound. I will link everything below. They're very popular for very good reason and I enjoy them a lot.
Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm thinking I'll probably do something like this again because it was genuinely really fun. So if you'd be interested in seeing that, let me know. But I thought it was a fun video. Oh God, tequila. We're gonna wrap this up now since the lighting and the tequila is not painting us in a super flattering light. So uh, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. I post a video about once a week. So I'm gonna see you next week. I'm gonna go edit this now. So if it's choppy, it's because we had tequila. <laughs>